This podcast is part of the Zeo to Hero Podcast Network. AvenuePodcast.net Hello, all my beautiful people. It's time for another fun episode of If You Give a Dad a Podcast, and I just want to say thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. Whether this be the first time that you've tuned in, or if you're a long-time listener, I'm glad that you're here to listen to this episode with me today. Um, I'm actually really excited about this. It's one that I've been looking forward to since I met the guy in January. I actually met him at the Northwest Arkansas Comic Con. He was one of the guests there. And the guy that I'm talking about is Townsend Coleman. He is a voice actor from my childhood, from a lot of you guys' childhood, actually. He was the voice of Michelangelo from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He was part of Inspector Gadget. He was on Fraggle Rock, so he was on all kinds of stuff. There was another big thing in my childhood called Adventures in Odyssey. It was an audio drama, and he plays the voice of Jason Whitaker on there. So I'm really excited to have him on today and for you guys to hear this episode. And for those of you who are here just to listen to the Townsend Coleman episode, welcome. I hope that you enjoy what you hear, and I hope that you stick around and listen to some of the other great episodes that I have here as well. So, if you guys are as excited as I am, then let's get this show on the road. If you give a dad a podcast. You're bloody welcome. You know. <laughs> Hey, Dad. If I get my hand stuck in a pickle jar, I'm straight up bull in a china shop, just <laughs> swinging around. Started writing songs when I was about 12 or so. Seriously? They're retrofitting me now. And I'm like, yes, finally. I also had the opportunity to go train with uh, Boyce Gracie and uh, Dan Sebrin. Wow. I like that. That's <laughs> different. It stands out. That day, I took my very first bump, and it was fun. There's only one section to go to first, yeah. the toys. Bro. I was like, no, man, surely this guy's not worked out that long. <laughs> I haven't laughed that hard since I was a little girl. What? Man, this guy won't shut up. And just a reminder before we get started here, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe to iGadap wherever it is you're listening to. Hit that notification bell so you are notified when a new episode drops. Also, make sure that you go out there and rate and review this episode. Tell me what you think of it. And the more people that do that, the more likely I am to be recommended to somebody else. Now, on to the show. All right, everybody. This one is going to be a lot of fun today. I'm uh, actually really excited about this. Um, I am talking to a man that... uh, pretty much grew up listening to he uh played um michelangelo in the teenage mutant ninja turtles he played the tick he's done all kinds of other things but one thing that i'm most excited about as you know i've had phil lawler on the show here before and um now i have on with me townsend coleman and he played the voice of jason whitaker in adventures and odyssey and this is just going to be a real treat uh townsend how are you doing today I'm doing great, man. And don't say played in the past tense because I'm still playing him. You are. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We're yeah. still doing Adventures in Odyssey after all these years. I've been going for 30 years on it, but uh, the show itself has been around for, what, 35, 36 years, something like that. Something like that. I mean, y'all are about to have your 1,000th episode. I mean, that's yep. insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're looking forward to it. We got a big uh, a big shindig, a big wingding in uh, Colorado <laughs> Springs uh, coming up in August. Right on. First weekend. Yeah, first weekend of August. I, I think I told you this whenever I met you. Um, I still have the CD of the 500th episode. Um, oh, no I, kidding. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think I got it at one of the local uh, Christian bookstores or something whenever it came out. Because, man, I, I, it's funny. I actually have like a stack that my mom gave me recently of some of my old CDs and cassette tapes. Because uh, I used to listen to it. Like, that's what I went to bed listening to at night was Adventures and Odyssey. Right, right. Gosh, we hear those stories all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. uh. so we'll kind of <clears throat> jump into everything here, you know. And uh, sure. so is this something that you wanted to do growing up? Or when did you find out that this was something that you wanted to do? Well, uh, you're not, not specifically doing, uh, uh, you know, cartoon voices and and uh, radio dramas and such although uh-huh. I, I you know i mean I, I always wanted to be an actor i knew that much ever since i was in fourth grade 
Yeah, we went and as a, a class project went and saw um, a local production of Peter Pan mm-hmm. that the older brother of a classmate of mine was in playing Michael. But it was a great production because they were actually flying uh, the kids and the people and stuff. I mean, it was fantastic. And, you know, the little my little fourth grade mind uh, didn't know the difference between that show and Broadway. So I just, right. you know, figured this this is this is Hollywood. And yeah. um yeah, so I saw that and I knew my buddy Greg's brother was uh, playing Michael in that and and I thought that's what I want to do. That's crazy. <laughs> that's exactly what I want to do. And yeah, and so I started pursuing it, you know, when I was in elementary school and then middle school and then high school and yeah, so um you know, acting the acting thing is is the acting bug bit me early and and has kind of always been on the yeah. radar for me, but uh, which is why I moved from Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I grew up, uh-huh. uh, to LA in 1984. So it'll be 40 years uh, coming up um, this Labor Day. Wow, crazy. Um, so yeah, so but but it's why I, because I um, had gotten into radio in Cleveland, so I was a rock jock there. I was a uh, a radio DJ for 10 years oh. uh, at, at a bunch of different stations in the Cleveland market. And, and um, finally after 10 years, and that's where I discovered voiceover freelance voiceover yeah. uh, because I was doing commercials. I was voicing commercials for the radio stations that I worked for uh, a couple of them. I was a production director at, and so that was just part of my job. But, but uh, I started getting calls from local ad agencies asking if I could, um, voice some some of their clients uh, radio and tv spots and yeah. i said sure um so, you know so i went and discovered what that was all about and they were paying me apart from the radio station i had nothing to do with the radio stations i was at and um i joined the union back then uh, 50 years ago it was in 1973 uh-huh. uh, th- that i joined uh, aftra and um and so that's where i started doing voiceover and a- after about five years of doing that I was making more money a year doing the freelance voiceover stuff uh, than I was working six days a week at the radio station. And so, wow. you know, it was a, a fairly easy decision for me to make to pursue um, voiceover in, instead <laughs> of being a DJ. Right. Um, so that's how that started. That was all in Cleveland uh, where that happened. And so in 1984, uh, I had just turned 30 in may of 84 and in june uh quit the radio station and just a couple of weeks after that i got a a phone call from our uh, landlord saying that he was uh, selling the house that we were renting and Mm. we had to be out by the end of september of 84. well i had three kids at the time and um i knew that i had to get them settled in school someplace if i was actually going to move so i came out here to l.a uh, during the summer, right after the Olympics of 84 and, uh, just tootled around and found a little place to rent over in Glendale and, uh, went home. Uh, we packed up the house. I sold a car. We, uh, I mean, literally two weeks later, uh, we were living here, uh, mm-hmm. pulled in over Labor Day weekend. Wow. So, so that, yeah, that's, that was kind of my quick journey from Cleveland to LA. Um, <clears throat> and then I, uh, I had a friend out here who uh, she and her husband were very gracious and and helped me get uh, interviews at each of their agents, uh, commercial agents. And uh, so I ended up signing with one of those agencies two weeks after I got here. And um, and then it things just kind of took off for me. I knew I could do some voiceover work because I had done so much of it back in Cleveland. Right. But that wasn't why I moved here. I moved here because I wanted to be an on camera uh, actor in, you know, movies and uh, TV uh, shows and such yeah and and so and so but i i signed with this commercial agency and uh, i started getting um some voiceover gigs uh, fairly straight away and then uh, started doing a, a lot of on-camera commercials as well so that was kind of keeping me afloat while i was trying to get my theatrical career off the ground my my um, uh, on-camera acting career right and um and so you know, so that's the way it was. And six months after I got here, I, I got a uh, an audition for a, a cartoon called Inspector Gadget. Yeah. And I, I was familiar with the show, 
uh, and this was in the spring of 85, but, and I was familiar with the show because my, my kids watched it when we were still living in Cleveland. Yeah. And um, so I went on this audition and I ended up getting a part on this series. Uh, it was only for the last 10 episodes of the series. And the character's name was Corporal Cape Man. He was a gadget's assistant. Okay. And I had so much fun doing that part uh, that I asked my agents to please send me out on, you know, more animation auditions because uh, it was such a blast. <laughs> and they did. And I started booking stuff. And, and so, I mean, you know, in fairly short order, um, I, I was booking shows and realized that, you know, I sort of had a bit of an affinity for this, um, this line of work yeah. and, uh, and loved it. And so, um, you know, I just, I kept going out on those. And in the meantime, my on-camera theatrical career uh, just wasn't happening. I mean, I was beating my head against a wall trying to, you know, I mean, I got a <laughs> couple of small parts in uh, a couple of movies and TV shows. Uh, but when I say small, I mean like minuscule. Um, but I, what I discovered though, in, in doing that was that I didn't really like that end of the business. The whole reason I moved out here was to do that <laughs> and then discover that I'm not that crazy about it. You know? Uh, so I, after two years of pursuing it, I just dropped it altogether and just concentrated on the, on camera, uh, TV commercials yeah. and the voiceover stuff. And I, you know, was, I was booking, um, some pretty big accounts, commercial accounts, voiceover wise. And uh, I started booking more um, animation, more cartoon series. And um, it's kind of one thing led to another and that, you know, the voiceover thing just ended up becoming my career. So I just wow. kind of never looked back and, and here I is. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm glad that it turned out that way. Cause I mean, you voice some of, uh, some of my favorite people over the years, you know, but I did want to ask you one thing. How did your kids react when they found out that you were going to be playing a, uh, the voice of a character on one of their cartoons that they watch? Well, I think, I, I, I think that they thought it was pretty cool. You know, they were still yeah. young back then. I mean, so in 85, my daughter would have been, my oldest would have been uh, 10. Okay. And yeah. And, and my oldest son was seven Okay. Yeah. And, and then I had a baby girl and I did not yet have our fourth um, uh, child, which is uh, my youngest son. So, okay. yeah. So I don't think, I mean, I, th I think that they thought it was, I think they thought it was cool. I don't think they knew what to make of it. You know, right. it's like, it's like when I go to cons and stuff and, and meet families and I talk to little kids and, you know, and, and even like, even like eight or nine year olds, um, I, I can always see in their faces that they're looking at me like, <laughs> wait a minute. So what do you do? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> who, who are you? I mean, yeah. I see those pictures up there on your banner that there's a picture of Michelangelo and the tick and, you know, uh -huh. uh, Corporal Cape Man and Waldo and, and these guys, but right. But uh, wait, so you're, you're their voices. <laughs> mm -hmm. but you don't you know but i can see in their faces they're like but you don't look like them like they're expecting right. like they're expecting a voice after life. exactly yeah so <laughs> yeah so i think my my kids were kind of sort of this same way I, I i you know it's they they didn't really quite know what to make of it yeah. but they but at the same time though they also knew that i was a dj and you know they grew up you know only knowing dad's job as being on the radio and, and gotcha. doing voiceover stuff and doing commercials. So I think maybe they put it together more than most kids might. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's still cool. You know, I mean, with uh, the reason why I asked that is because now, since I've been doing this podcast, uh, my son actually goes around telling people that I'm famous uh, because of all yeah. the different people that I talk to on the show. Right. And, right, stuff. Right. and so it's funny to see, you know, a kid's reaction whenever, you know, they they get that in their head. Oh, well, my dad's a big deal, you know, or something. And, you know, I imagine sure. that it was uh, there was a, a point there's aha similar for your kids as well. Yeah. Um, y yeah, I, I think there was. I, I think that maybe sometimes it was a little cooler for them when they actually saw me on TV. Yeah. You know, either yeah. in one of the little bit parts that I played. 
um, or, or in commercials, you know, right. they'd see a commercial and, and say, oh, there's dad, you know, so that, <laughs> that I think they, they equated with being, I don't know if they thought it was famous, but being, right. now I get what he does because yeah. I see him there and I recognize him, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I just, I, I, I do remember um, when I was really starting to get busy uh, within just a, a year or two of having moved here, uh, that my youngest daughter um, at the two, she was 15 months when we moved here. So, so say, say two years later, um, you know, when she's three and a half, mm -hmm. uh, four years old around in there, um, you know, I remember reading her, I used to read uh, Dr. Seuss books to my kids yeah. uh, at night. And so I, I, you know, I'd read her Dr. Seuss books. And, and I remember at one point, you know, I would do these silly voices for him. And I remember her <laughs> looking at me going, daddy, talk normal. <laughs> it, it's like, it made her nervous that yeah. I, that, uh, that, that I was, you, you know, talking in these sort of weird, wacky voices because yeah even though she looked at me and she knew it was me because she recognized me, mm -hmm. she didn't recognize the voice. Right. And she couldn't put that together. And that made her nervous. It, yeah. It scared her. And so she'd want, she didn't like it when I did the character voices um, early on, but you know, but then uh, as she got a little older and she'd see me on TV uh, or see the cartoons, then she started to put it together. Right. But, uh, yeah. I actually had I actually had a a situation um about a week and a half ago where I was babysitting my my youngest granddaughter so she's 2 hmm, right? okay and 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 uh so she just turned 2 and 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 I was over um watching her uh, her name is Remy so when I go over to uh, babysit I call it Remy sitting so I was Remy sitting <laughs> one day and and I went over there and I and I started doing some silly voices with her, and she did exactly the same thing. She looked at me. Now, now my my grandkids they call me Grandpa T. And, okay. And so and so she calls me Grandpa T. And um, but when I was doing uh, some silly little you know noises and voices and stuff, yeah. She looked at me, and and she was and she came right up to my face, looked me in the face, looked me in the eye. And then started waving at me and, <laughs> and, and saying, Grandpa T, Grandpa T. And I recognized it was exactly the thing that used to affect my youngest daughter when she was a, around the same age um, all those years ago. So, wow. Yeah. Um, little kids, you know, they have a, sometimes a hard time trying to make sense of, they do. of yeah. what they see on TV, you know, because on TV, it's one thing. Right. But then when they, you know, hear the voice from coming out of a real person, yeah. it, but that doesn't look like that on TV, right. now all of a sudden they're scratching their head. Yeah, yeah. So did you find it easy to find the different voices that you've done? Was it something that you just developed as you were going along? Or were these like voices that you already had? And you was like, oh, this will go great for this character. No, yeah. I'm not I'm not any sort of prolific voice creator, uh, character voice creator. You know, um, uh -huh. I leave I leave that to the guys who are truly talented at that. <laughs> um, you know, the the Rob Paulsons and Jim Cummings and Maurice LaMarches <laughs> of, of the world, you know, Jess Arnell and these guys. Um, you know, these guys are they're 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 comedians and they're impressionists and mm -hmm. they, you know, they're they're creative vibe goes deep deep in them my my creative vibe is a little i think a little different um so for me because i when i came out here i like i was saying i think i said uh i never gave any thought to doing cartoons right it just wasn't on my radar now yeah. when i was on the radio at a couple stations i i did some character you know stuff yeah. when i was doing a morning show um and that was one thing, and I sort of created some characters back then. Don't remember much of them, but I I don't think there were anything really to write home about. Um, so when I when my agent sent me on that audition for Inspector Gadget, and I got that part um, of Corporal Cape Man, I what happened was because I'd never auditioned for a cartoon before, 
I didn't really know what I was doing. So, so when I showed up, a gal named Marsha Goodman, she was the um, vo uh, voice director of the show and also the casting director. So she um, brought me in to her office and, and it was just a regular, uh, you know, uh, office office, you know, right. it wasn't a studio or anything like that. She had literally a Radio Shack cassette deck um, <laughs> just sitting on her desk yeah. with a Radio Shack mic plugged into it. And that was it. And oh, wow. when I showed up, she, you know, gave me my script. And, and the way these auditions work is they give you a script um, that's not the script of a show. It's actually just a page of sample lines that that character will say. Okay. Oh. And, that, and then along with that on a separate page was a picture of the character mm -hmm. and then a description of the character's personality, maybe a little about his background, uh, that sort of thing. Right. So you've got, you've got these three elements, basically. You've got a picture of the character, you've got a description of the character, and then you've got the character's lines, his, gotcha. his sample lines. Okay. Yeah. Well, so when she handed me these things, I just, I, I looked at them and I thought, I, I mean, I, I, I think I was able to figure it out pretty quickly that, oh, okay, this is what the character looks like. And, and right. you know, this is what he's about and uh -huh. this is what he says. So as I read through that, uh, that info, you know, I took about five minutes or so and uh, she said, just let me know when you're ready. And I said, great. And, but what I discovered was when I looked at the picture of the character, that mm -hmm. to me in that moment told me everything I felt like I needed to know about what the character sounded like. So, yeah. so I, for me, it's a very visual cue yes. um, that I get from looking at, from, from trying to figure out what a character sounds like, um, really is based on uh, what he looks like. Now, I've learned over the years that that's not necessarily always true. You know, there are characters that, that will sound nothing like what they look like. Right. You know, because the actor perhaps brought something different to it. Maybe it was an imp based on an impression they do, or maybe yep. it was based on just going completely opposite of type. So if you look at this character, say, and, and I'm, I'm just bringing up a generic one, say he's a big, you know, 300 pound roly poly guy, you know, with sort of a fat neck and a little head. Yeah. Uh, you know, and these little stubby legs and these little stubby arms and stuff, you know, and maybe maybe he's got a, you know, a, a bunch of beard. Um, and you might look at this character and go, oh, I know what he sounds like because he's a big, you know, fat, dumb guy. You yeah. know, he's probably going to sound like this, you know, real stereotypical. Yeah. When in fact, you know, maybe the actor, the, you know, the creative actor who got the part ends up coming up with a voice that sounds like this. Yeah. And you know it doesn't it doesn't sound at all like what the character looks like you know so <laughs> yes so, so so that's going against type right um, you know which I I sort of learned as I went along but I but I always start with you know based based on what the character looks like uh -huh. here's here's what I think he he might sound like right and so when I looked at the the picture of Corporal Cape Man um I came up with a voice that immediately hit me. It was sort of a, and kind of an old Ed Wynn uh, version um, of a character. And, and, uh, and Marsha, she laughed when I did it. And that's always <laughs> a good sign, you know? So, yeah. So she said, that's, that's great. Now, uh, because he had these big buck teeth, um, the character, uh, not Marsha. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, he. I. I gave him. I gave him a good bit of a lisp. To okay. It. And and she just she liked what I was doing, but she wanted me to take the lisp out of it. So gotcha. so I did. So I I backed off on that, and we played with it for about five or ten minutes, and that was that. And she sent me on my way. Wow. And uh, a couple of days later, I got a call from my agent saying you booked that Inspector Gadget character. Oh, I'm wow. like, whoa, you're kidding, really crazy. So I showed up in a little studio in Burbank. A, a couple of days after that, and there were just four of us in the studio. It was Maurice LaMarche, uh -huh. Frank, Frank Welker, me, and Don Adams. Wow. And, and I was like looking at these guys. Now, I recognized Don Adams, of course, because I was a big Get Smart fan when I was a kid. Yeah. And um, 
but I had no idea who Maurice LaMarche was and I had no idea who Frank Welker was, uh -huh. you know, well, come to find out very quickly, <laughs> you know, who the, who these guys were. Now, interestingly, it was, it was Maurice's, it, it was Moe's first uh, cartoon series also. Uh, he hmm. had not long before that come down from Toronto where he's from. And, uh, and, you know, Mo is a comedian uh, as well as a very gifted uh, voice actor and, and an actor and uh, and so, so um, he, you know, he fell into the cartoon world too, and right. uh, he knew who Frank was, but I didn't at the time. Now, now, cr crazily enough for me, when I was still living in Cleveland, shortly before I moved out here, my kids watched that show. I would hear it on in the background, and I would hear this character, Doctor Claw. Yeah, and I could not, for the life of me, imagine who the actor or what the actor who did yeah. that voice might look like, mm -hmm. you know, because it was just enormous. Yes. And so when I showed up at that first session, uh, one of the things I was really curious about was meeting whoever this actor was. Well, I showed up and I looked at Mo and I realized it couldn't be him. I looked at Frank, <laughs> it couldn't be him. I knew it wasn't Don Adams. So I figured the actor wasn't there. Yeah. And maybe they just recorded him separately. Right. And, and, uh, and so we're reading through the script. Or, or I'm, I'm reading through the script, highlighting my lines, uh, and and I see that there are some Dr. Claw lines in this script. So I figure, well, when we get to those lines, we'll just skip over them, and they'll get the actor, bring him in separately to do his lines. Yeah. So we start the first pass. We start recording our, our the, um, take one. Uh -huh. And we get to that page with the Dr. Claw lines on it. And... <laughs> And we're just about to, what I think is skip over the line when all of a sudden Frank, who's sitting literally 18 inches away from me <laughs> on, on my left, yeah. he opens his mouth and out drops his voice of Dr. Claw. Oh, wow. And I just could not believe what I was hearing. And I looked <laughs> at him and I gasped, I mean, out loud, forgetting that we were recording. And... <laughs> I said, "Oh my God, it's you!" And he, you know, he was very, very funny, very gracious, and he, he smiled and he said, "Yes, it's me." I, he could see that I was just stunned yeah. by that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but and Frank's got a very sort of light, easygoing, you know, um, natural uh, voice. Right. It's, you know, it's a little bit higher, and so you kind of wouldn't, you kind of wouldn't think that that voice could some that that throat that that person <laughs> could also embody the voice of not only dr claw but a billion other you know monsters and and yes. evildoers and and such so yeah. you know as as well as you know scooby-doo and and uh fred and um you know wow uh, uh, everything else that frank has done i remember yeah. the first time i saw frank's after i got to know him a little and working with him, I remember the first time I saw his name in credits in a in a feature, and I was in the movie theater seeing uh, Star Trek, uh -huh. and and um, I don't remember whether it was one or two. It was one of the Star Trek films. Okay, <laughs> and the credits roll at the end, and I see Frank Welker's name in the credits at the end, and he was credited for doing Spock's screams. Oh, and that was it. Wow. Spock's Spock screams, yeah. So huh. I, th I think it was the one where did Spock dies in one of those moves. I don't remember. It was a million years ago. Anyway, <laughs> or was in, in great pain. But uh, anyway, that was Frank screaming for Leonard Nimoy. Wow. So, yeah. But that's the kind of stuff Frank does. He, you know, he specializes in monsters and, and, right. and creatures and all kinds of stuff. But also in crazy, you know, vocal sound effects and animals like mm -hmm. on Inspector Gadget, he was Mad Cat and Brain the Dog as well. Uh, oh. Uh, as well as, uh, you know. Um, he did a little bit of all of it. Yo, he was everywhere. He was <laughs> every, He was all over that show. Just yeah. as he is in any show that they use him for. Right. He's, he's, he's a million guys yeah. in all yeah. these. I mean, I have long said, you know, this this town could do with about, uh, you know, 300 less, less of us, fewer of us. Uh, <laughs> And, and just use Frank. <laughs> well, yeah. one thing that I love to uh, watch um, 
is on TikTok when you have these different voice actors and they just go through and do the different voices that they've done over the years. And oh, some yeah. of them, they just blow me away because I'm like, I yeah, did right. not realize that that's who did yep. that voice. And yep, yep. Uh, he was one of them <laughs> for me, you know? Uh, uh, and so I, that that's really cool to hear. I didn't know that he did the, the voice of uh, the claw. So yeah, that's, that's really cool. Oh yeah. I mean, you, you've got guys, you know, who are like Frank, you know, like Jim Cummings, for instance, or, yeah. or Rob, Rob Paulson or Jess Harnell or, or Maurice yep. LaMarche. Um, you know, these guys that do uh, Billy West that do all these voices uh, that you might not realize until you see a, a TikTok video like that, or you look at their banner and it's got, you know, or you go to their IMDB page and you scroll through, you know, yep. nine pages of credits. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelievable. You know what, what, what some of those guys are capable of. It's crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah. So how often do they have you guys like recording in the same room? That way you can kind of like play off of each other and what you're saying. Yeah. Well, prior to the pandemic, um, all the time, okay. uh, that's the way they, they always do it. And uh -huh. they always prefer to do it is have you in the, the studio. Uh, they call it recording ensemble. You're all okay. together. Yeah. And I so, guess it makes it more natural that way. Well, not only more natural, but, um, but more ener uh more energetic there's yeah. there's just more of way more of a a uh, uh, a um um a, a sense of being able to play off of each other and bounce off each other right and and so um yeah so th that's why they they like having everyone in the studio together uh the energy is just way different yeah. you know and especially when you get some of these you know uh high octane uh, you know uber creative guys yeah uh, and, and when i say guys i don't mean just men but you know men and women right right in the, in the studio together it's a it's a gab fest and i'll tell you it, it is <laughs> it is hard to keep up which is why i generally don't even bother trying you know i yeah. am a very appreciative audience uh in sessions like that That's cool. um but i will say that when the pandemic hit and of course they couldn't do that anymore they had to figure out a way of being able to record, you know, uh, remotely uh, people primarily from their homes. So everybody was, you know, you know, wiring themselves up for, for sound at, at home and uh, using, um, uh, um, um, help me out, help me out, Townsend. Like, don't, don't act like an old man. Um, <laughs> using, using Zoom uh, and stuff. The systems like, well, yeah, yeah it, it like Zoom, but not right. Zoom, uh, but it would be audio based. So okay. like IPD, IPDTL or source. Okay. Um, okay. The beauty of IPDTL is that you can get six actors on the, uh, on the uh, session simultaneously, all remotely from different locations. Oh, wow. Um, and they can all hear each other and bounce off each other, kind of like you would in, in a studio. Okay. Um, whereas uh, the other uh, um, systems, you really can't do that. Or yeah. Not that easily. So, so anyway, but with the pandemic, that's how things started going. And I think in many cases, um, a lot of people still, still record that way. Either the mm -hmm. talent prefers it that way or the producers prefer it that way because yeah. they can save on studio costs. Um, you know, there are all kinds of considerations, but well, um but um, but I will say this that but that's the way it is for TV animation, right? Um, for feature animation, where they use primarily uh, celebrities, uh -huh. um, those sessions are done. They bring the celebs in, you know, they schedule them each, and the celebs typically come in by themselves and record their lines wild. Gotcha, um, just by themselves. Gotcha. So okay. Yeah. So, yeah, you were uh, talking about the uh, during the pandemic and stuff. And I've had a, a few voice actors on here and stuff that do a lot of like uh, anime and stuff or like Funimation. And, uh, you know, I know that with them, like they send microphones to their houses and stuff like that. And they have mm -hmm. like whole studios set up um, yeah. in their house now. And, you know, they still yeah. prefer to do it that way. It's pretty interesting, you know, uh, just hearing the different ways that people have been able to still do this even you know while the pandemic was going on and then going back and it not being exactly the same as it was you know prior to it but i mean there's yeah there's a lot that's changed to that way 
Yeah, no fooling. Um, I mean, the pandemic, obviously, yeah. uh, changed so many things right. in so many ways. Yeah. And and our business is, you know, just one of them. Right. Um, you know, it's like a lot of people are having a hard time going back into the office after for the last three or four years, they've gotten used to working from home yeah. and digging it and finding out that it works. Exactly. It's okay. Yep. You know, it, it, they can actually not get away with it can actually be just as productive at home right. as they are in an office. And yep. they don't have to worry about traffic. They don't have to worry about parking, you know, all that stuff. Yep. So, yeah, the pan- pandemic has brought about so many changes. But in our business, man, let me tell you, <laughs> pretty much everybody in town, and and I'm, I'm not talking about just uh, animation people, but uh, people do, do, who are doing any sort of voiceover work, yeah. um, they were, everybody was every voice actor uh, in town was scrambling and not just in town, but I mean, all over the country was scrambling to either put in a home studio or, you know, beef their existing home studio up. So, you know, that it was, uh, it was clean and quiet and, you know, real strong internet and, and such. So yeah, but the pandemic changed all of that. And I had actually been working at home before the pandemic for, for quite a while because I had something called ISDN, which was a way of connecting studios to connecting me to studios uh, or networks. Yeah. And um, because at the time I was um, so part, so a third, a third rail, (laughs) I never (laughs) thought of it like that. A third leg of my three legged stool of my career. Uh Um, So I, so I did a a lot of, um, commercials of commercial voiceover accounts right uh, animation um mm-hmm. which started in 85 for me but then in 1993 i got this fluke audition for for a do to do a promo over at nbc uh for a campaign they were starting called must see tv oh and yeah and so and so i i went over and, and auditioned for this thing they liked what i did and they put it on the air that night and it was the first must see tv uh promo and it was for, they were launching a, a, the John Larroquette show in August, uh, late August of 1993 for the uh, 93 uh, fall season premiere stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, but they liked what I did. They started bringing me back in every day for like two weeks after that. And within like a month or two, they were giving me all the Tuesday night lineup stuff uh, for their must TV comedies. And then after about three months or so, by uh, Halloween weekend of 93, yeah. they gave me the Tonight Show uh, promos to do also. Wow. So so here within, you know, a couple of months, I find myself, you know, doing the promos for uh, Seinfeld and Frasier and, and uh, come 94, 95, whenever that was, uh, for I launched a little show called Friends and... Um, and mad about you and all these uh, uh, comedies on NBC at the time. And I was doing the Saturday morning kids block as well, but wow. then also doing the late night stuff uh, for, uh, I was doing uh, the nightly promos for Jay Leno for the tonight show. Uh-huh. And then also doing the promos for uh, Saturday night live and Conan and, and all that stuff. Wow. So this NBC thing really took off for me and, and, um, Within a couple of years, I realized, oh my gosh, I mean, this this has become my career. Now, at the same time, I was still doing animation mm-hmm. uh, as well and, and a lot of commercial accounts, but it was the NBC thing that ended up just becoming, you know, such a, it's such a, 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 a huge, yes. um, uh, um, well, you, you come up with a word because I can't, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was, but it was the, but, but the biggest thing that had happened to me in my career really yeah. um, up to that point, because it ended up lasting for 16 years. Oh, wow. uh, so I did all the comedy promos for all the NBC comedies uh, for all those years, um, starting with Seinfeld and Frasier friends, mad about you, all those uh, uh-huh. all the way up through uh, 30 rock and community and the office uh, in 2009. That's cool. Uh, when they f- finally let me go. And then I ended up over at ABC after that mm-hmm. doing the same thing, comedy promos for about five years. And then they let me go. And, and then after that, it was over to Fox for a year or two. And, and then uh, they let me go. So, 
promos, uh, you, you know, have been really the lion's share of my work. Yeah. Uh, in all the years that I've been here. Um, it's just a, yeah. so what I was going to say, my point being that <laughs> because of doing that is why I got ISDN when gotcha. really very few people had it. But, but for those of us who were lucky enough um, and fortunate enough to be doing promo work, um, we had to, we had to be able to connect to the networks like right now. Right. And they had to be able to get a hold of us. And if they had a change that needed to be made on a five second tag, uh, yeah. you know, they would call me up and say, Townsend, can we get you in five minutes to, to, to do a quick tag? Sure. You know, so uh, rather than me having to drive back down to Burbank and, yeah. you know, go, go to the studio down there. So I, that's that where, makes it easier on both sides. Re- I'm sorry. It makes it easier on both sides. Oh, heavens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's when I started kind of working from home long before the pandemic. Hit. Okay. So you were, Used to being in your own home studio by that point then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Calling all heroes and fans of the extraordinary. Get ready to morph into a world of fan fiction like never before. I am Cosplay637, and I'm here to tell you about Power Rangers Universe 19. Picture this. Ultra Rangers defending the universe. Cyber Force Rangers navigating the digital frontier and the high-flying adventures of the Power Rangers Sky Force. But that's just the beginning. We've got Kamen Rider Wizard conjuring magic, Kamen Rider Drive racing against time, and Kamen Rider Ghost unraveling the supernatural mysteries. And that's not all. Experience the musical journey of Power Rangers Masters of Music and the blood-shivering adventures of Kamen Rider Kiva brought to you by Ty Tiger. Then brace yourself for the epic tales of the Beetle Troopers by Mark the Red Cornish Ranger. So, why should you tune in? Because Power Rangers Universe 19 is not just a podcast, it's a portal into a multiverse of fan fiction brilliance. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast platforms. Search for Power Rangers Universe 19 and join me, Cosplay Dude 637, on an adventure that will ignite your imagination and redefine what it means to be a hero. And remember, and let the power protect you. Did you prefer one over the other? Did you prefer doing the voice acting with, uh, with cartoons or did you like the doing promos and stuff more? You know, Jared, the, the, um, I, I can't say because they both are so unique. Right. And are so are, are such amazingly wonderful. Yeah. Exciting. Um, blessed ways to make a living. Uh, you know, I mean, yes. I, I wouldn't, I don't think I would pick one over the other because, you know, they, they each have their advantages and their disadvantages. Right. Um, you know, but I mean, one of the advantages of, of doing the cartoons and the animation over the years, of course, is that, well, and I, and I think partly it's because having been on a show like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the, yes. the original series in, in, in the 80s and 90s, yeah. um, because being on a popular show like that, I I am very fortunate enough to be um, going out doing uh, Comic Con appearances now. Uh-huh. You know, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't be doing that if I were just doing a promo or commercial. Right. That's true. Um, it's yeah. I, you know I I I have I have the privilege of being able to do those Comic Con appearances because of my animation work that I've done. So so the animation you know has its has its ad- I, don't, I don't want to say advantages it, it, <laughs> in it a just, way it does it's got, it, it's got its pluses yeah um that uh, doing promo doesn't and 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 conversely promo has its advantages um that that, that don't really trickle over to animation and right. the same with commercial yeah. you know so so I, I really have had these these three very distinct legs of my career that that I'm just super grateful for. Yeah. Well, and like you said, they've got their perks, you know, so that's, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So I kind of want to switch this over a little bit and talk about a couple of the characters that, you know, I brought up at the beginning of the show. Um, sure. And one you just talked about was uh, playing Michelangelo. Um, mm-hmm. My favorite character in, in uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was Michelangelo always, you know, All right, dude. Yeah. totally good answer. 
Yeah, because <laughs> if you had said like it was Raphael or like um, Leonardo or, or uh, who's my other brother? Oh, yeah, Donatello. <laughs> yeah, if you'd said it was one of them, I would have been very disappointed. I'd be hanging up the phone right now. <laughs> but, dude, all I can say is bodacious. Yeah, <laughs> you and I are going to have to grab some pizza, head down to the old turtle lair, and nosh on a little anchovy and hot fudge pizza. Whoa, cowabunga! <laughs> You just made my night, man. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it'll be 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell me about auditioning for that. What was it like? Well, um, not unlike uh, any other show that I've auditioned for. So that process that I was describing earlier about yes. in auditioning for Inspector Gadget uh -huh. was exactly the same um, for Ninja Turtles. Um now, I will say that we, I, I can't say that we had a leg up, but uh -huh. Rob and I were both working on a show called Fraggle Rock, which, okay. was, a, 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 which was a Muppet show, a Jim Henson Muppet show yep. originally. But, they, um, but NBC wanted to do an animated version of it, so they worked out a deal with the Henson people and, um, and were, were casting uh, people to do voice matches uh, for the characters from the Muppet version of Fraggle Rock. Okay. And I got just really uh, lucky and got the voice of Gobo uh, on, yeah. on, on that and architect and wrench and Robbie was, um, he was Boober and uh, Marjorie, the trash heap and um, a, a boatload of other characters. So <laughs> he and I were both working on, on Fraggle Rock at the time. And our voice director uh, was a guy named Stu Rosen and Stu came into one of our, our Fraggle Rock recording sessions one morning, and he says, you guys aren't going to believe what I'm going to be casting and directing next. Look at this. And he opens his briefcase and pulls out a comic book of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And, I, I mean, we all looked at it, and I looked at it, and I'd never heard of it before. So yeah. I, I just, I mean, I'm thinking, yeah, well, have fun. You know, good luck <laughs> with that. Um it's just the title of it to me, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. You got to understand that this is back in in uh, 1980. It had to be 1986. Yeah. And um, and so uh, this is back in the days when you know the, the cartoons were shows like you know My Little Pony and Strawberry Shortcake. Right. And uh, Powerpuff Girls, you know, and, and shows like that. Yeah. So Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a, a, um, a pretty distinct departure from yes. what we were used to. And yeah. And person, and maybe it's just because I don't have much of a sense of imagination, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I it, it it didn't seem like something that was going to be a, a huge hit to me. And, but, but Stu said, but I'll bring you guys in to audition and, you know, we'll you see what happens. So we, so we at least knew the casting director. And I think because he was already working with us on Fraggle Rock, he might've been predisposed to, to want to continue working with us. I don't know. Okay. Um, but all, all I know is that, is that uh, that's how I knew Stu. And so he brought me in to audition for uh, Ninja Turtles, uh -huh. and just just like with all the other shows that I've auditioned for, they give you you know a piece of paper with your picture on there. So they now I will say that that all of us who are doing the voices of the four turtles on that original series, we all auditioned for all four turtles. Oh, and yeah, and so they gave me uh, along with the rest of us um, all the, you know the pictures of all four turtles and yep. their descriptions and their sample lines um for the audition and so i looked through these things and and so i read for all four and um and ended up ended up booking booking the series i got a call from my agent they said hey good news you booked that that weird one teenage mutant ninja <laughs> turtles and i said oh cool that's for Stu. great you know well, yeah. when i show i said do you know what part and and my agent said well i'm not sure i think it's either Michelangelo or Leonardo, but uh -huh. they're gonna they'll they'll tell you at the at the uh, at the um, at the first session. Right. So, 
So uh, I show up at the first session, and there's Rob, and he was Raphael. There's uh-huh. Barry, and he's Donatello. And there's a, a buddy of mine, Cam Clark, uh, who they weren't sure whether he was going to be Leonardo or Michelangelo. Uh-huh. And 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 same with me. They weren't sure whether I was going to be Leonardo or Michelangelo. Uh-huh. But they knew it was going to be one of us two, and right. and that was it. So Stu says, as as we're getting ready to record the first pass, the first take of our first episode, um, he says to me, Tony, why don't you do Michelangelo first? Cam, you do Leonardo first, and then we'll do a take two uh after break and 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 we'll have you guys switch i huh. said great okay you know so we did that and got through our first pass and then took a break came back from break and so i'm expecting to read leonardo's uh role now on this second pass and Stu says uh no 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 tony just you you keep michelangelo f- for now we'll we'll <laughs> worry about switching later yeah and Cam's like, so do you want me to do Leonardo again? And and Stu said, yeah. So we just kept <laughs> our parts on that on you know for that first recording session, and which I thought was a little odd because I don't know how you're going to worry about it later, right? Yeah, recording it now, you know, yeah. and, unless you bring us back in, you know, just the two of us to re-record the opposite characters. Yeah. So, but that never happened, huh. and so. And so this was the first episode of that first five-part miniseries that we did, which was the the um, uh, that was the pilot yeah. for the show, and and so I just ended up being Michelangelo. It was almost like with the flip of a coin, you know, uh, <laughs> rather than Leonardo. And yeah. same with Cam. And I mean, he's pissed about that to this day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know he's very grateful just to have been on the series altogether. Yeah. As we all are. But uh, yeah, but I think, you know, he, he, there isn't a panel that we do that he doesn't, you know, make a point of saying he, Leonardo didn't have much of a sense of humor and yeah. didn't get to do goofy stuff and he didn't have a great catchphrase. You know, we've got to think of something fast, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Whereas, you know, I got, I was the lucky one that got to say cowabunga a billion times. Exactly. So, Complete yeah. polar opposites when it comes to characters. Right. So. right. So, so that's, so that's how the audition, I mean, the audition was just like every other show I've auditioned for. Right. Yeah. So another character that uh, I, I want to talk about. And in fact, whenever I walked up to you at Northwest Arkansas Comic Con, the first thing I said to you was, you're my favorite character on Adventures and Odyssey. And so I want to talk about that for a little bit. Um, of course. I, yeah. I, I grew up with this. Uh, there okay. was a lady that went to my parents' church that mm-hmm. um, was a radio disc jockey. And she actually, um, they had tapes that like they weren't playing on the radio anymore. And so they weren't, they, I guess they were going to throw them away or something. I don't know what they were going to do with them. Well, I ended up with the tapes from the radio station of Adventures and Odyssey. And it was, it, the radio ones, you have the beeps in there that goes through for the commercials, all that stuff. And that's what Wait, I so were they were they were they like reel to reel tapes? Uh, they were is cassette it? tapes is what they were. Well, they were cassettes. Okay. They were cassettes. Yeah. Wow. But they had like the beeps in there, you know, that was like the timing for the commercials when it was played on the radio and everything. Right. And but are you ye- saying that the radio stations when the radio stations aired Odyssey, that they that they ran it off of cassettes? Yeah. Holy mackerel! Really? Yeah, that's, this was this was that's in crazy. The 90s. I didn't. I, okay, well, I mean, I, it makes sense because in the nineties, yeah, yeah, pretty much reel to reel was you know uh, a done <laughs> deal. But um, wow, I had no idea that the radio stations were airing those off of cassettes back then <laughs> in the eighties and nineties. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And on one side, it had a sticker, and it had Wit and Connie, and on the other side, it had Eugene and Chris. Yep. Actually. Yep on the yep. other side. So, um, and I remember when I actually got my first like box set of adventures, Nazi, cause I listened to those for years. Like I had those episodes down pat. I knew everything about them. I had the uh, castles and cauldrons episode, you know, and all these other ones that they were really good. Uh, there was one uh, where Tom Riley, there was somebody who was uh, poisoning his farm with, uh, sure. with runoff, you know, I mean, things right. like that have happened, 
you know, multiple times with Tom. So um, <laughs> later on, I bought um, my first cassette series, and it was Darkness Before Dawn. Okay. And I believe that that's where I was introduced to your character, uh-huh. Jason Whitaker. Yeah. And one of the coolest <laughs> characters ever, you know, I mean, he had the whole, uh, you know, government spy type character going on and everything with the NSA agent. And man, that was probably one of the coolest things. I got into that so much. Um, Adventures and Odyssey still a part of my life, actually. Oh, that's cool, dude. Well, yeah. Well, thanks. But thanks for being a, a fan and a listener for for so long. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But I, you know, but I love meeting you know fans who have been listeners from the beginning. Right. Um, you know the fact that the the show's been around. You know, first of all, it's a radio drama, so it's not yes. not a cartoon series. There's no picture. Yep. You know, and that's one of the things that I just love about radio dramas is it calls upon the listener to use their imagination and, yep. and fill in the gaps in their mind. You right. know, so, so Jason or Wit or Connie or any of them could look um, completely different. You know, you'd ask 10 different people if they hadn't seen a, you know, a stylized drawing from focus right. uh, of these characters. But, you know, what do you think, what do you think Wit looks like? Or what do you think, you know, Chris looks like? Yeah. And, uh, or Eugene. And, and they'd give you 10 different answers. And, <laughs> and it, it's, what I, it's what I love about radio drama. Is oh, yeah. You really have to tap into using your imagination. And it, it, it's, uh, to me, it's, it's a more exciting medium uh, yes. than, and, uh, than pretty much anything with pictures. Um, I agree. Only because it requires you to do that. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, that's that's what I've I've loved about it. But but cool. So you so you were a, a fan of a couple of those uh, early episodes that uh, Jason was in. Yes, um, and that actually led me into uh, the Last Chance <laughs> Detectives, which I know your character was in the first season of that. Um, when it came to uh, there was a a group moving into town, and I know that. Um, your character, I guess, were you introducing uh, that series, I'm guessing, and they used Jason Whitaker as a way to k- kind of bring people over to listen to the other series, I guess, right? Well, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm imagining that that was the whole point of that. Yeah. Um, Last Chance Detectives had uh, had a whole, was also video as yes. well. They, okay. they had a whole video thing that I was not on. Uh, okay. Just as Adventures and Odyssey had maybe a season or two. It was before mm-hmm. my time when they did uh, some videos. Yes. Uh, but my character, Jason, was not in those. Right. So the only thing that I've done for them is just the radio drama. I got gotcha. you. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, I remember doing those uh, several episodes of uh, Last Chance Detectives. For yes. Sure. So I know that the, the reason why um, the whole, the Jason character was kind of brought in was around the time of uh, when the guy who played Mr. Whitaker had passed away, correct? Mm-hmm. His name was Hal Smith. Hal Smith. And he was uh, Otis on uh, Andy Griffin. And that always blows me away <laughs> when I think about that. Yeah, he was Otis the town drunk on uh, the yeah. Andy Griffith show. Yeah. Completely different <laughs> character. Oh, tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> but Hal but, was, Hal was a, a, an amazing guy and an amazing character himself, yes. too. But yes, he passed away. So. Yes. So go ahead. Sorry. So what they did is they kind of split the role of Wit up into two people. And you had Jack Allen and you had Jason Whitaker. And Jason was the more um, adventurous side. You know, he was the one that worked on the imagination station and mm-hmm. did those things. And then, you know, the caring side of Wit was more, it went with the the Jack Allen character. And I love how they were able to, um, you know, kind of fill that void you know i mean it's not going to be completely filled because nobody can you know replace the character wit but being able to do that you know and bring in characters introduce new ones and um have them take part in that role i thought that was a, a really great way to continue the show well i did too and and i i think at the time uh, f- focus just felt like there was no way they were going to be able to cast another actor right to- 
to try and fill Hal Smith's shoes. Yeah. So that's why they created those two new characters. Uh, one, I, I should explain for the listeners here that, um, <laughs> so the role of Jack Allen, played by Alan Young from the Mr. Ed show, mm-hmm. uh, he was Wilbur on Mr. Ed, um, w- it, that, that character is an older contemporary of wits. Yes. They were, they were um, school, they were school chums when they were young. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then the character of Jason was Wit's son. So m- more, uh, was younger, more impulsive, you know, yeah. uh, more adventuresome, uh, that kind of thing. So yes, you're right. They sort of split um, the personality of Wit in, in a couple of different ways and yeah. gave some of those character traits to his son, Jason, and a couple of the more mature um, grown-up uh, characteristics, <laughs> if you will, uh, you know, spiritually mature um, yeah. characteristics to Jack Allen. Yeah. And so that's the way it was going to be. And so that's, that's when I started on the show uh, in 1994. Mm-hmm. And as, as well as did uh, Alan Young. And, and so we started working together and I don't know how long it was after, you know, we, maybe it was six months later, maybe it was a year later. I, I honestly don't remember, but, but at some point, after our characters had already um, begun to establish themselves, yeah, somebody called uh, Focus on the Family's headquarters um, in Colorado Springs from Seattle saying that, I just want you to know there's a guy on the radio up here who sounds just like Wit. I yeah. mean, exactly. Spit yep. an image of Wit. Right. And, and so they said, really? Um, well, if you can get us, you know, his information or something, we'd like to talk to him. So they did, and I guess they had a phone meetup, and and to hear the guys at Focus tell it, they they were just they got goosebumps when they heard this guy's voice on the other end of the line. Right. And they said, "Oh, oh my goodness, it is, it is Wit, it is Hal Smith, right, doing Wit," and so they they brought him down to Burbank and and auditioned him uh, at the studio where we record. And and uh, so I should uh, just uh, interject here real quick, even though Focus on the Family is in Colorado Springs and their production studios are there and that's where the show is actually produced. Yes, it's actually recorded. The the actors, the voice actors actually record here in L.A. Oh, um, OK. Act, yeah. Actually, in a studio over in North Hollywood. Okay. So we record here and then they take. So they come in a couple of times a year from uh, from the Springs to record us here. And then they take those um, files back to Colorado Springs and actually produce the show there. Gotcha. Um, and that's, that's where they, you know, marry it with all the music um, okay. that's, uh, that's done and, and, the, and do all the Foley and sound effects and, and all that stuff. So, um, so anyway, they, so they brought um, this guy, his name is Paul Herlinger down mm-hmm. from Seattle to audition him down here. And they fell in love with him. They, they fell in love with his, not only his voice, um, but just him as a person. I mean, he he's, was just such a great guy. And he became wit. And largely, people kind of didn't know the difference between his wit and Hal Smith's wit. They were that close. Right. Um, and, then, and then, so Paul um, w- uh, voiced wit for quite a few years. Uh, and then, unfortunately, he too passed away. Yeah. Uh, and then that's when they uh, cast Andre Stoika uh-huh. as Wit, who is the current Wit, right? And brilliant at it also. So yeah. So yeah. So that's where our characters came from originally. He, it, and you know they they all do have done a great job with those parts. And uh, you you were talking about um, how nobody could tell the difference between those two. There was one thing that I I, I was able to find, and this was the only thing. And it was their laugh was different. Oh, between um, Hal's wit and yes. and and, uh, and Paul's wit. Yes. Oh, is their, that right? Yeah, their laugh was different. Uh, How about that. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, that and you know that's the only way I'd be like, oh, this is an older episode. You know, if I was listening on the radio or something like that, and it would be when Wit would laugh, I could tell the difference in that. <laughs> Maybe that says how much I listened to it a little bit too much or something. I don't know, but. <laughs> Yeah, no, but, but you got a sharp ear, and um, but you know it's 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 
that's one thing that I I just love about um, you guys and about fans of just all these genres of work that we do and, and right. stuff is when somebody is so into something, it's really curious to me. It's really interesting to find out what is it that you love about this show or about yeah. this radio drama or about yeah. this cartoon or about, you know, what is it? What is it? How, first of all, how did you discover it? How did you discover that you loved it yeah. and why, you know, and, but very often, because I wasn't like this when I was a kid, uh, very often it's because, you know, people just, they latched onto a cartoon series that they just loved the voices and then found out that these voices were done by voice actors. And then yeah. they would be listed in the credits at the end of the show. Right. And then they'd start mixing and matching names and going, oh, wait a second, that's Frank Welker. <laughs> Wait, I saw his name in the credits of another show. And then they'd start, you know, doing some investigation like that. And yeah, and, and then that's how they become fans. Yeah. So, you know, but 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 everybody's got something unique and peculiar to them that sort of sets them apart. It's like you saying, yeah, I could always I could always sort of zero in on Wit's laugh and be able to tell the difference between the two actors because yep. of the laugh. Yeah, I just I think that's fantastic. man. That's great. <laughs> Hal's was a little a bit of a uh, raspier laugh, a little huskier laugh to it. Yeah. OK. You know, and uh -huh. so I, I can always tell that. But, man, I, I got to tell you, I'm what I'm geeking out over here at the moment with this, <laughs> because uh, like I said, I, I grew up with this. I grew up in a, a, a Christian household. My dad's pastor of a church. Uh, we didn't have TV growing up. And so right. this was my entertainment. A lot of times was listening to adventures, and Odyssey or reading comic books, unless I was at my grandma's house, then I was watching Ninja Turtles. Right. There you go. <laughs> Cause grandma would let you get away with it. Exactly. Yeah. Grandma <laughs> lets you get away with anything. So <laughs> right, right, right. Well, that's but, great, man. Yeah. Well, man, I have really enjoyed talking to you tonight. I've got just a couple more things I wanted to ask you before I get you off of here. Sure thing. So, what would be the best advice that you would give somebody who maybe wants to oh. get into a career like this? Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Let me see one word. Don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, cause I'm thinking, um, <laughs> that, uh, I don't know, Jared, you know, the, the business is so different now than it used to be, you know, Right. Years ago, I would have said, first of all, you know, if it's animation or character stuff you want to do, um, you have to be here in L.A., yeah. uh, it, which is still largely true, I think. Um, mm -hmm. It's not impossible to get animation work living in another market, you know. So right. we certainly have the technology to be able to connect, you know, studios. Yes. But, um but it's for animation and going back to what we were saying earlier about them, because they are going back to wanting people in the studio together, yes. uh, actors in the studio together again. And, and so I, I think that if you were really serious about wanting to get into animation, you kind of have to be here in LA. Um, but you know, there's exceptions to every rule. So who knows? Um, I, I would say, I, I would say this business is really ultra competitive. Mm -hmm. And which is not to say that newcomers, you know, can't come in and break in. They do all the time. I mean, all of us were newcomers at one point. All of us started someplace, right. you know, and it's still true. It's just that when you start now, the, the barrier to entry is so much greater right. than it was back when I came to town 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, just because voiceover is a thing. Now it yes. didn't used to be, right. you know, the internet is a thing now when it didn't even exist when I moved here. And, <laughs> you know, so, so be, because of the internet and because of social media and because I, it, those two things alone, and because um, early comic cons, this whole voiceover industry has now become uh, um, like a, a golden ring for people. It's, yeah. it's become a goal for people. Um, Whereas, you know, when I came to town, again, like I was saying, 
I knew I could probably do a little voiceover work because I had done so much back in Cleveland. Right. That was pretty much all announcing, though. That was doing commercials, you know, not doing characters. So, and I was only thinking of it as an adjunct. You know, back in those days, you, I don't think there were very many people that set out to want to be a voice actor. Now, to be sure, there were people like Nancy Cartwright and Corey Burton and, you know, folks like that who absolutely knew that that's what they wanted to do. And that's why they moved here, mm -hmm. you know, it was to be a voice actor yeah. um, and primarily, you know, doing characters. Um, but 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 for me, you know, and most people coming to L.A., you didn't come here to to do you didn't come here to do commercials. You didn't come here to do voiceovers. You came here to be an actor. Right. And move in film and TV. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and so, you know, I kind of, I kind of, as I was, you know, sharing earlier, you kind of fell into it right. um, without really thinking much about it. Well, now people want to do it for a living and with technology being what it is, you know, with the, with an, a, a laptop and a fairly decent USB mic and a pair of headphones and a, fast internet connection, you know, you can be auditioning for stuff on any number of these um, a, a, a voiceover audition websites like yep. Voice123 and such. And, um, you know, unfortunately, most of them are pay to play, which means you've got to pay a fee to just be able to audition for these things. It's a whole another line of work now for, you right. know, that's cropped up in the last 10 years. Yep. But, but, um, but I, I would say, you know, just know know that the odds are stacked against you right off the bat. Now, that will discourage a lot of people, maybe discourage most people. Yeah. But for those people that aren't discouraged by that and you just say, I don't care. I, I want to give it I want to give it a shot because I think I've got it in me. If you can't see yourself doing anything else on this planet um, to make a living except doing voiceovers, then I say Give it a shot. Go for it. Um, there's a great resource that D. Bradley Baker um, has. It's a website called I want to be a voice actor dot com. So okay. if, if you just go to I want to be a voice actor dot com and just, you know, peruse that thumb through, you know, all the, the info that D's got up on that website. It's a it's a real compendium of a really useful information. And um, so that's a great place to start. I would say, you know, all voice acting is acting. So mm -hmm. don't forget that. It's not just about being, uh, having a good voice, you know, or, or, or something. I mean, it, yeah. it, it is acting. And I don't care whether it's animation or commercials or promo or, or audio books or, or doing a phone tree, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. you press one for you know, <laughs> yeah uh, that could, it's all acting it all is acting so if you're not an actor that's okay but take some acting lessons get involved gotcha. in theater yeah. get involved in your school productions get involved in community theater whatever but start taking some acting classes start taking some improv classes even if you don't want to be an actor uh in front of the camera or on stage if you want to be a voice actor you got to be an actor so, so, so study there, um, take workshops. If you happen to be in, in a market that has some decent voiceover workshops or character workshops or, uh, that kind of thing, um, voiceover workout groups, uh, yeah. some of the larger markets, certainly like LA, New York, uh, Chicago, um, uh, Atlanta, uh, they've, they've got these sorts of things. Yeah. Um, and you know, and then and then just go for it. You know, put your head down and and don't give up. If it really is something that you feel like you just you you just have to do, or at least have to get out of your system. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, all right, man. Is yeah. there anything coming up that maybe you want to talk about? <clears throat> um, no. You know, I'm. I, I, I hate to say, but I'm sort of largely retired. Okay. Um, my last regular gig that I had was uh, voicing the, the daily promos for Live with Kelly and Ryan, uh, okay. which I was doing back when it was Live with Regis and Kelly. So I did that gig for about 17 years. 
<laughs> and then um and then um, as happens to you know to all our gigs you know we end up uh, getting replaced um for one reason or another and um uh, yeah so i got replaced uh, about a year and a half almost 2 years ago mm. and um and after that i realized boy you know what i've been going full full steam uh, yeah. for for 40 years for over 40 years in in my in my voiceover stuff right and i'm kind of tired and not that I don't want to keep working, I would love to keep working, but um, but I also I find that you know there is a bit of ageism in even in voiceover, which you wouldn't think there would be, no, you know, because I don't I don't think I sound like I'm what one would imagine a, a seventy year old sounding like. Although I'm not seventy yet, I'll be seventy in May, but <laughs> but still, but I'm still you know a teenage mutant ninja turtle. So go figure. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I still got all the energy and all the stuff that I feel like I've always had. And Definitely. so it's, I don't, I don't think it's because I'm not viable or relevant anymore, but it's because there's a whole new raft of kids coming into town, just like there was 40 years ago when I came into town. Yeah. And, and it's just the, it's the nature of the beast. It's, it's, it's the circle of life. It's true in any any um, career that you get into um, is you will eventually sort of age yourself out of it a yeah. little bit. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so I've, I've slowed down in that sense a lot, but I am doing, so really these comic cons now have become my career. They become my job. Right. And, um, and I just love it. I love going out with these because most of the cons that I do are with the other three uh, Ninja Turtle guys with uh, yeah. Rob Paulson, Cam Clark, and Barry uh, Barry Gordon. So, so the four of us, and then often with Renee Jacobs also, who is the voice of April, uh -huh. um, the four of us or the five of us will go out together and do these cons together. And because this is the 40th anniversary of the Ninja Turtle comic book, uh, it's kind of a big year for us. We're doing a lot of shows. And, right. and then uh, I, I imagine in... 2027 in three years it'll be our 40th anniversary too so so those are keeping me very busy yeah. um you know other than that um spending time with my my little remy lou my my grand my two-year-old <laughs> granddaughter and uh and loving every minute of it awesome man. and and i miss my other grandkids my i got seven grandkids all together but they're oh. all out of town so yeah um it, it makes it difficult to you know just drive over and and have dinner with them. But um, yeah, but no complaints. Very grateful for, for <laughs> all that, uh, that I've got going on and that I've had in my life. Love my kids, my grandkids and yeah. All happy right. boy. <laughs> well, man, it has been amazing talking to you tonight. I've really Thank enjoyed you, this and uh, maybe we'll get you back on here again at some point. All right. It'd be great. Yeah. Thanks, Jared. All right. All right. Well, dude, all I can say is turtle power. <laughs> Whoa. Generic audio commercial Zeo to hero take 43. Hey, listener, it looks like you're having fun over here listening to insert generic name here. If you like what you're listening over here, come on over to the Zeo to hero podcast where you can join Billy and myself, the bulk and skull of podcasting. If you want to listen to Ranger powers and you want to go into and talk about Kai. anime, Gundam. Oh, what did I make them wrong? You're supposed to say Zero to Hero is the best. And Billy and Jim has Vulcan Skull of Podcasting. It's funnier than any other show out there. And oh. you didn't say Power Rangers, right? Get out of here oh, do it again. It. Fine. Generic audio commercial. Zero to Hero. Take number 44. Hey, listener. It looks like you're having fun over here. Listening to insert generic name here god god oh, come god! on wrestling fans join us for the diamond state flawless tv recordings live in front of a studio audience every two weeks join us in the diamond dome for the best live independent wrestling diamond state wrestling is on the road to crowning the second annual king and queen of diamonds you never know what's going to happen or what you'll see in Diamond State Wrestling. The show is called Flawless. It's every other Sunday at the Diamond Dome in Springdale, Arkansas in the Next Level Soccer Center. Doors open at 3 o'clock with bell time at 4. 
Tickets start at $10 for general admission and $5 for children. For more information, check out DiamondStateWrestling.com. All right, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed that episode with Townsend Coleman. He was a great guest, and uh, I love how he was on here doing all these different voices and things like that. That really made my day. And uh, he was just, he was a wonderful person to have on. And I just want to say thank you to him for being on the show, taking time out of his schedule to uh, be on there and talk with me. Um, It was really cool. And I look forward to uh, maybe getting him back on again in the future. So, uh, next week's episode is actually going to be the one that I told you last week is going to happen. Um, I was supposed to record with Cullen Bunn, and uh, he actually got sick, so we had to reschedule. And hopefully everything works out good, and I will be recording with him uh, here really soon. He is the writer behind uh, Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe. Um, he's done all kinds of cool stuff. He's a horror writer, and he's wrote for Marvel and DC and Image and Dark Horse and all kinds of stuff. He has a, uh, a movie that he's credited for being the writer of on Hulu even called the empty man. So, uh, yeah, look up his stuff and, uh, that should be who I am having on next. And while you're waiting for another episode of I get to drop, why don't you check out my podcast networks, the OIW podcast network, the Zio to hero podcast network, and the Avenue podcast network. They all have great stuff on there, and you're bound to find something cool to listen to while you're waiting on my show to come back for uh, with another episode. So make sure you go out there and hit them up and uh, show them some love. So as you know, I have merch out. Um, if you'd like a shirt or a tumbler, or uh, I'm even going to have koozies here soon, or some stickers, just hit me up and let me know what you would like. Tell me your size and where to ship it, and we'll work everything out. But, uh, yeah, my wife makes all that stuff. She's pretty awesome. She she makes all of the stuff that I uh, design or one of my friends designed for me and stuff and makes it into really cool stickers and hats and all kinds of things. She brings my ideas to life, and uh, I don't know what I'd do without her. So uh, if you guys could go out there and uh, show her some love, too. Uh, it's Cups and Teas by Stacia is the name of her business. And uh, she makes great stuff. Great quality stuff. Uh, So, yeah, look her up. If you like the way my ending theme song sounds, when I say I love you guys at the end of the show, that's D-Cure. He makes all kinds of really cool music, and uh, he's always creating new stuff. So if you like the way that sounds, make sure that you go out there and follow him. I will have a link to his website in my show notes. So, um, Original Geek just did their first release of The Eighth Day comic it is now out you can get copies of that uh they did the release as i'm recording this at kapow comics today it was a pretty cool turnout from what i saw they had a lot of people come out and see them we'll be posting stuff about that throughout the week um but also vengeance issue three is now available for pre-order um make sure that you get your uh third issue of this because this will be the conclusion of the dawning arc for vengeance go to the website originalgeek.com and uh get you pre-ordered for that or get some of the other stuff they've got pretty cool merch on there as well and i think they got some shirts on sale so yeah i'll have a link to all of their places in my show notes um as well we'll be doing some live events here really soon I believe our next one that Nick will be doing is at Heroes and Wizards Comic Books and more in uh, Web City, Missouri. Um, He'll be doing a release there as well for the 8th Day comic. So if you want to go out there and say hi to him, you can do that. And then we will both be in Paris, Texas after that at PTX Con. So if you're in that area on April 13th, make sure that you come out and say hi to us. It's going to be really cool. This is going to be my first time being a guest at a con So, um, yeah, come say hi. Maybe get some merch. I'll have plenty of it there. Also, I have a branch off of If You Give a Dad a Podcast Now called If You Give a Dad a YouTube channel. And uh, there's another one coming as well called If You Give a Dad a Cosplay. So the YouTube channel is out now. So make sure that you go and follow Ty on there and keep up with the videos. He has two of them out so far. 
And Willie will be doing the If You Give a Dad a Cosplay here really soon. I'll uh, be keeping you guys up to date on that. And there will be more coming with that here really soon. I'm very excited about the future of If You Give a Dad brand. And uh, we'll be doing more stories even. Because, you know, we've done the If You Give a Dad a Dragon Dagger. And If You Give a Dad a um, Autobot. So we've got more stuff coming. Great stuff. I'm excited about all of it. So make sure that you stay tuned. So you hear me talking about social media. Make sure that you go out there and follow me on all of it. Um, I am pretty much everywhere. Just go and search if you give a dad a podcast, and uh, you can find me on there that way. Or you can go to Google. I should be the first 10 to 15 results on there as well. If you want to send me an email, send it to giveadadapodcast at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you guys. Or if you guys want to uh, order your merch that way, you can do that as well. Um, but I do love hearing from you guys. I love getting feedback. So with saying that, um, I have a favor that I need you to do for me. As you're listening to this, make sure that you go out and rate and review this episode. Tell me what you think of it. Whether you liked it or whether you didn't, let me know what you think of it. Um, because the more people that do that, the more likely I am to be recommended to other people as well. And uh, I would love to see this podcast grow even more. I've seen it grow a lot in the last two years. Uh, last week was my two-year anniversary episode that I did with uh, Billy and Jim from the Zeo to Hero podcast, uh, which was great chaos. You guys should go listen to that. It was a lot of fun to do that episode with them and doing the ending part with them. We kind of collaborated and made something funny for the ending of that episode. So make sure that you go back and listen to that one as well. Um, but yeah, I've been doing this for two years, and I love how much this show has grown, and I would love to see it grow even more. Also, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe to this. Uh, hit the notification bell wherever it is that you're listening. That way you are notified when a new episode of iGadap drops. So, we've come to the end of another episode of If You Give a Dad a Podcast. And it is time for Billy's favorite part of the episode. And that is Dad Joke of the Week. <laughs> I hate it when people say age is only a number. Age is clearly a word. <laughs> Jared, you stay over there. You stay over there. Yeah, you get yeah. back. You get back. I right now. I'm done with this guy. Over there. I'm bad. I'm no, guy. bad. Get, let me out. I'm getting, out. I'm getting the spray God, bottle. I'm getting the spray bottle. I'm going to swing. Okay. Spray bottle. I'm going to put them on wall. Walls and chairs. All right. I love you guys. I hope you have a wonderful week. And I will see you next time. Bye. Cast on. He calls his beautiful people, then tells us who we have on. The best part of my day, the world blocked out in my pods. Tell my friends all about it so that they follow along. And the host is kind of nerdy, but guess what I am as well. I don't feel so alone and I began walking out of my shell. Heard a story, I need a connection I haven't felt. I'll be looking for the next one, tell then farewell. It's the podcast for me. Have it on, better go see. Listen closely, download and tune in remotely. It's the podcast for me. Have it on, better go see. And listen closely, download and tune in remotely. This podcast is part of the OIW Podcasting Network.